What's going on, awesome people? Welcome to another episode of the Awesome People Instagram Live Series. This marks, holy crap, 23 days straight of IG Lives. I can't believe you're still sticking around. You're not sick of me yet? Appreciate you guys. Uh, it's been a great ride so far. So many great conversations with some truly awesome people. Every day, I just feel a community building. Every day, I feel a lot more energy coming through these great individuals that I have the pleasure of either getting to know or get to know even better. Um, and it's been great seeing so many new faces come into my page and just, you know, these great relations that are being built. I'm extremely, extremely grateful for them. And my guest today, I'm excited about her. It's actually somebody that I just started following on social media about a year or so ago, and she was putting out some really great content. She's a clinical psychologist, Dr. Shiva Asar from Orange County, California. And um, she actually talks a lot about relationships and being single and anxiety and uh, self-confidence. That's a huge one too. So we're going to try to jam pack all these three different topics uh, in this 30 minutes IG lives and I'll let her do the explanation of it and she's going to be joining us very soon. I already see that she's clicked a, re a request join so hang tight. Before I do welcome her however, friendly reminder that next Wednesday, December 29th, Zendigi, a five hour special episode, nothing but Persian music uh, featuring DJs Kia, DJ Yaz and DJ Sam. Uh, it'll be via YouTube for you to enjoy starting 6 p.m. Eastern time. December 29th. Click the link in my bio if you want to set a reminder. We'd love to see you there. It's going to be fun stuff, great music, great celebration to recap uh, an amazing year. And <clears throat> for those of you who don't know, every single episode that I do at IG Lives, I try to do a 10 seconds of gratitude. And as you can guess, it's 10 seconds of me shutting up and just doing a nice little gratitude session, counting my blessings. I've been going through a lot of stuff with the family and a loved one in the hospital. So it's been pretty hard, but I, I enjoy coming to you guys. I enjoy having you guys come to this little window right here, and it, uh, it gives me a lot of energy. And so I wanted to make sure that I continue having these conversations no matter what's going on around my life. So for the next 10 seconds, I'm going to just be quiet, count my blessings. Feel free to join me if you like. All right, let's rock and roll, ladies and gentlemen. I'm so excited to welcome Dr. Shiva Asar. The West Coast. Stay tuned, grab some popcorn, enjoy the conversation. Hi, Iman. Hi, Shiva, Jun. how are you? <laughs> Good, how are you doing? Excellent, thanks so much. Thank so happy to have you a part of this, uh, this series. No, thank you so much for having me. And what an amazing way to start. I did the gratitude exercise with you. That was so nice. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah, it's cool. I mean, I wish I had more time to do it, but then people would think I'm weird if I do it like for a minute. <laughs> so I do 10 seconds just to remind myself to, it's so important, right? Yeah, it's so important. No, we would just sit with you for a minute and list everything. That was great. <laughs> I mean, I'm, like, I'm sure... Happening? I'm sure there are Instagram pages that literally that's all they do. Just somebody turns on the IG Live and just meditate, which is great. Kudos to them. But yeah, uh, totally. you're, you're, you're definitely the right person to talk about regarding this type of gratitude and just taking care of your mental health. So let's kind of just start with you telling those who don't know, Dr. Shiva Asar, you know, your, your, your personal background a little bit and then also your professional background. And then we'll talk about the juicy stuff that we intend to talk sure. about. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. So I'm Dr. Shiva. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist, as mentioned, and I work with remotely right now. So I work with clients in California on self-confidence, social anxiety, relationship issues. Um, I also do trainings around mental health related topics. So I'm very passionate around reducing the stigma associated with mental health. And I know in our community, unfortunately, we have so much stigma. It's getting it's getting better, but there's definitely Slowly, a lot of surely. stigma. Yeah. Um, and then personally, um, I'm Iranian American, born and raised here, but I usually say I, I feel more Persian in a lot of ways. <laughs> so I still think in Farsi, I grew up um, regularly visiting Iran. So I have a huge um, connection with the culture. And I think I bring a lot of that within my work. So I do really focus on how mental health shows up in different cultural communities, especially ours. Um, so thank you I for having that. me again. Yeah. I, th I think it's great. I mean, one thing uh, that has been a common denominator as far as IG lives is individual psychologists, just uh, health, life coaches. And, you know, this discussion, I just feel like you just cannot have it enough, you know? And yeah. so like, I'm just, I'm, I'm just grateful that there's so many awesome people like you that are trying to do in their careers 
what we're trying to talk about, you know, mm -hmm. occasionally here, but you guys do it on a day-to-day -day basis. So before we kind of get to the nitty gritty, why, why this career path? You know, what was it that gravitated towards it? Yeah. And like, why specifically in your field, uh, anxiety and self-confidence and relationships? Because you kind of niched that down to it. You did yeah. such a great job on your social media with regards mm -hmm. to that. Um, so talk about that. Thank you. Um, so as far as why psychology, I honestly, I just always knew I wanted to become a psychologist. I wish I had a, it, you know, I, that really is it. It was just felt very natural to me. I was always that person in group settings. So I like loved helping people and emotionally supporting them. And I was more of a listener. So I think it was just a very natural path. And I just saw myself going that path. Um, as far as self-confidence and social anxiety, I think on a personal level, these have been things that I've worked through growing up. Um, but I also feel like just the more that I worked with different um, people, the more I realized that even the most successful people, they really do struggle with their confidence. And so I think, and especially within our culture, I think there's so much pressure to be perfect physically, academically, professionally, as like in all ways, I was going to say, as having as that, in all ways, yeah. right? And I think on a personal level, I've experienced that, but also professionally, I just noticed that, you know, people that on the outside, I would think are, oh my God, they should be so confident. They should have it, you know, they have everything figured out. I realized like they too do struggle. And so it really made me want to support people and just feeling like really owning who they are. There's so much strength that we all have. And I think it makes such a difference when you can own who you are and really show up in spaces feeling confident. Um, and so it just made me, I just think one of those, it's one of those things that when we can feel confident within ourselves, it really changes every experience from relationships, well, from how we show up, everything. And I know one of the things that you um, suggest is like self-talk or, mm -hmm. so if, if it's in addition to self-talk, anything else that, you recommend that like everyone can start doing right now without having to go to step of calling people like you and stuff. Sure. You know, what are some day-to-day -day stuff that we can do to, to get that self-confidence boost? Yeah. What I would say is um, even more than self-talk is just pay attention to your thinking. I think so often we have certain thoughts and we have this story that we tell ourselves about ourselves or about other people. And it's oftentimes inaccurate. Like we have these stories about ourselves that we've picked up from our childhood or from specific experiences. And rarely do we stop there and say, is this actually true? Is what I'm telling myself true? Is Because we believe these things. I think when we have a thought, we tend to treat it like a fact. And so I would just encourage people just to take time and just pause and just really say, what am I saying to myself? What is the story that I have about myself? Um, we're always, there's always this background noise, right? We're always speaking to ourselves. And so really just be asking yourself, what, what am I saying? Um, is this a thought or is it a fact? And I think another thing to ask yourself is, is this narrative helping me, right? So like, is it serving me? So a lot of times I think, um, as mentioned, I work a lot with um, professionals who are focusing on their self-confidence. And I think a belief that a, a lot of us have who tend to be hard on ourselves is I'm not as qualified as other people, or I'm not whatever, as pretty as other people or as charismatic. And after you really assess, is this a factor or not? I think it's asking yourself, does this help me, right? Does this belief, is this serving me in some sort of way, right? Is believing that I'm not as qualified as other people, is that making me more qualified? Or is that making me more charismatic? Or is it actually getting in the way? Is it getting in the way of me being able to show up and own my strengths, but also accurately be aware of my areas of growth? Um, so really challenge and question your thinking. Our thinking is not oftentimes helpful or accurate. What about um, how much impact would you say social media has had on people not feeling that they are pretty enough, that they're um, smart enough and yeah. good enough, you know, and, and, and how can we combat that? Because I feel like sure. it, it has become common knowledge that it could be harmful. How much would you say it has impacted and how can we, again, combat that? Sure. Um, yeah, absolutely. I would say that there's a lot of research around, obviously, social media has been great. We've been able to connect and it's been great throughout this time, but there's been a lot of research around how it can contribute and influence just mental health um, conditions and struggles. And I think specifically with self-confidence, I think even though intellectually we may be aware of that, you know, people on social media tend to put their highlight reels, right? They tend to share what they're most excited or proud of. 
I think in the moment when we're, we're not oftentimes thinking from that space and we, in the moment, instantaneously will compare ourselves to other people. So to that amazing relationship, to that accomplishment. Um, and so I do think that it ha can have, a, and it has had a really big impact on self-confidence. So I'm, I'm a proponent of really putting limits on your social media use um, and really being intentional, not just the limits, but like intentional around the content that you're taking in. So taking in content that's positive, that's educational, that's inspirational um, versus just taking in, you know, content that a lot of times just negatively impacts us. Uh, personally, I think that, um, I, okay, what, what's really worked for me is that I literally eliminated a lot of pages and, and yeah. people that did not serve me. Like, if yeah. not, it happened like two, three years ago. I was like going through a really, really tough time in every sense of the word. And then it was even compacted with COVID shutting down my businesses. So like, you know, it was definitely the worst times for me. And I, I just started deleting and removing people that are not bringing me positivity, energy, inspiration, motivation. Mm -hmm. And then like, and I decided to use social media as like an outlet where I just continue to share my journey. And then I saw how many people were gravitating towards it. So like, mm -hmm. personally, that's kind of been just like my experience is that I've tried to make the best of social media and, and you know, just kind of declutter, clean up. And like, yeah. I feel like when, when you're constantly just looking at people that are just are just on flying jets and showing off and partying and stuff. Of yeah. course, it's going to get to your head, but I don't I don't choose to follow those kind of pages. So it's yeah. kind of work for me. Hopefully, that's the right track. No, no, for sure. I mean, you have such an amazing community. I think that's actually why I started following you because you've just you could you very much feel like the connection and community with 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 the stuff you're sharing. Even though we've never met, met, I've always felt connected with what you've shared, and I do think it's really aligned with what you mentioned. Awesome. Um, I do think one other thing I would say is like oftentimes when we go on social media, um, again, intellectually, we're aware that like this person is showing their highlight reel, but usually when we're feeling down and we go on social media, in those moments, I think people compare how they're internally feeling with what they see, like the image that they see. And mm -hmm. I just want to I know we're all aware of this, but just reiterate, like we have no idea what is going on for people internally. People are usually struggling in ways, and I always say this, that are either similar to ours and they just haven't shared it, or that are completely different. And you just yeah. may just not be picking up on that. And so no two situation is the same, even though it may look better. <laughs> <laughs> so um, speaking of so your, your page as well, actually, so you, you definitely talk a lot about relationships and um, how to how to be single and be happy at it. Can you kind of touch on what kind of was a catalyst of you focusing on that area, especially and, and, you know, any kind of tips or tricks that you can kind of sure. share to boost confidence in that level as well? Yeah, sure. I don't know. I think I was always, so I tend to work with a lot of young professionals. And I think um, there's always been this belief that to be single is this negative thing, right? Like, um, even in our culture, I think in our community, people are always asking, are you dating someone? When are you getting married? Um, and so I think it actually, um, in my in the work that I do with clients, it's like, I really do focus on how can you improve your relationship with yourself. And that is something that we can especially do when we're single in order to have those better romantic relationships, those better friendships and ever, any type of relationship. Um, and so I think it comes more from a place of wanting to empower people to have just a more positive experience. I think when you're single, you have a really great opportunity to really get to know yourself, get to know what do I want? What don't I want? Just to be more intentional. Um, as far as some things to help with, you know, self-confidence, again, I would say paying attention to your thinking. I think another thing is seeing, seeing dating as an opportunity, right? Like the fact that you are dating, it's an every, well, I shouldn't say every, a <laughs> lot of our dating experiences, there are lessons in it. Either you learn about yourself or you learn about someone else. Um, and so I think just going into it, recognizing that this is a process um, where you can really help to really understand more of your own insight around yourself or like what you want out of life. Um, and then I think one other thing that I'll share, and I don't know if I even fully answered your question, but, um, but what I would say is like when you're single, I think, and always, but especially I think when we think about, oh, what, like, what can I do during the time? I think it's um really asking yourself you know what are the things that I'm looking for in a partner right like what are those traits 
like and what are really the non-negotiables like people will oftentimes say like well I want them to be this height and you know is the height <laughs> really is that going to be the person is the height going to be supporting you you know what I mean when you're struggling <laughs> so like really be asking and being honest with yourself what are my non-negotiables and do I embody those right am I the person who's generous who's like whatever you want to say educated professional whatever you want to say and I think using that time to really um strengthen those traits within yourself um because I think that in, in itself is going to give you more fulfillment and it's going to help you in connecting with those like-minded people so I would think that like the concept of you have to love yourself before you love somebody else for mm -hmm. it to be like a healthy relationship what are some of the things that you do to help with your happiness to just kind of love yourself what can other people here do besides the positive mindset I get, but are there other things that you do that have worked for you in order to understand yeah. yourself better, to really like dig down and, you know, just appreciate all the great things that each person individually has? Sure, sure. Um, so yeah, I think the ch like challenging my own thinking is very important, but also I, am like you, I practice gratitude a lot. Um, so I have like a daily gratitude practice. I use a journal, but I think you don't even need a journal. I just, I think it's just taking a moment every day and identifying two to three things that you're grateful for. Um, that's made a huge, I started doing that more intentionally during uh, COVID. That's made a huge impact on just how I feel. And we know from the research that simply intentionally focusing on what's going well helps people in feeling better, helps them in coping with stressors, and ultimately allows you to view life situations more accurately. I think when we're struggling, we and our mind just has a tendency to just focus on the negative, but especially when we're struggling and there's a lot of negative right now for a lot of us, you know, we tend to hyper focus on those things. And so I think just simply identifying also what's going well um, can make a huge difference. And I do that for myself. Um, so that's part of my own morning practice. Um, another thing that I do that I think could be really helpful with just feeling better, but also self confidence is self compassion work. Um, so I, I what I mean by that is um, treating yourself like you would a friend. So if you had talked to me, Iman, like maybe like 15 years ago or 10 years ago, I would have been like self-compassion, like no way. Like I was, <laughs> and I think that's the case for a lot of people. When I talk to them about self-compassion, they're like, well, Shiba, if I'm self-compassionate, then I'm just being easy on myself. Or, you know, I'm just accepting the status quo. Um, but really, really, it's actually um, just in moments when you're struggling, really asking myself, what do I need right now? How do I, can I feel more supported? How can I, you know, and if that's hard for you to identify, what would I say to a friend, a loved one, a child who is in the same situation? Well, how would I treat them? How would I speak to them? What would my tone be like? So I've tried to be more compassionate and that's helped me a ton in, have, in improving my relationship with myself, but also just improving my self-confidence. Um, I think even within our culture, I wouldn't say everyone, but I think a lot of us tend to be really critical of ourselves. Um, there's a lot of societal community expectations, again, around how you should be. And we're critical of other people too. And I think, um, you know, that we know just from the research and what I've experienced myself is like that just has a really negative impact um, on self-confidence and just feeling good. So I would say practicing more self-compassion. So you mentioned our community a couple of times, and obviously everything we're trying to do at Unite and Conquer is to just make us better, yeah. not just individually, yeah. but as a community. Uh, and I'm sure you have both Persian clients and non-Persian clients. When you, when you kind of go on a macro level and you look at our Persian community and the cases or the individuals and the circumstances that you deal with, and then you compare it to the non-Persian, what are some of the things that you like, you know what, I really wish that the Persian, and this doesn't have to come from a bad place like no 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 it's yeah. just like let's let's be real with our own people so that we can improve what what do you look at as some things that like you know yeah i just wish that our community our parents would be like this uh, that our their children would be a little bit more like this what type of recommendations would you have for our whole community so we can all thrive together sure no great, great, great question um I would say a few things. So I would say, um, and I think a lot of these show up for other collectivist communities as well. I don't think it's just us. Um, yeah. But I would say checking in more with one another around how we're feeling, right? So um, that may sound so basic, but I think a lot of us growing up, um, you know, our, at least my parents, um, and I know and with other clients, we don't tend to focus a lot on emotions. Like how are people feeling? Really getting to know 
one another? How can we support one another? And allowing people to feel uncomfortable emotions when those come up, right? I think we try to st hold away from that. We focus, you know, everyone needs to be happy all the time. Um, so I would say an increase, I would say checking in more with one another. I think the other thing is um, helping one another and in, for us as individuals, but also as a community, taking more time to check in with ourselves of what do I want my life to be about? What are my values? I think so often we go after a career set, uh, like a career goal, a professional goal, academic, whatever. And oftentimes those are influenced by our community um, expectations or familial expectations. And then people get into careers and they realize like, I just studied 15 years and I don't want to be a physician, right? Like, I, you know, and so I think just taking more time to, um, you know, ask yourself, what do I want my life to be about, right? Like, what are the areas that are most important to me that give me the greatest sense of fulfillment and going after that? And I, I think as people who are around individuals who are doing that, also being more open that there's not just one path to happiness, right? I, I, yeah. I you know, when I work with especially younger um, adults, you know, when we're talking about parents, right, I oftentimes will say, it's not, I don't, you know, we're not talking bad about your parents. Like most parents mean well, right? Mm -hmm. And so for many of us, it's becoming a doctor, you know, that's because they want you to be successful in whatever way. But I also think that as parents, as people who are around individuals who are doing that soul searching, it's important for us to be open and um, to the different paths of happiness and fulfillment um, that, I don't th that I don't think, you know, that is a struggle for some of us, I would say. My question for you here is, and this is a little bit off topic, so bear with me here. Yeah. Um, you talked about emotions and how like a lot of times in families, especially parents, especially Persian fathers, you know, they, they kind of lack that emotional connection, especially with their children. And I think especially with a lot of their daughters, you know, like mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not generalizing. I'm just kind of like, sure. you know, kind of thinking about things. Is that how can Persian parents learn how to um, connect better emotionally with their children. Is that something that has to be done from a psychologist level? Or, you know, like, what if the kid really want not even a kid, like a 25 year old that wants to be able to connect better with their father or mother, but they're dismissing that there's anything pro problematic happening when in reality, there is that disconnect. How, mm -hmm. how can how can we bridge that gap? Does that make sense? It's a weird sure, question. Sure, sure. But I'm no, trying no, no, to figure out sense. how we can improve between parents and children. Yeah, you know? yeah. So I was curious. Yeah, it makes sense. I think, um, so twofold. I think it's going to be important for parents or older sibling, whatever, to also feel comfortable. So for each one of us to feel more comfortable with our own emotions. I think oftentimes when there's a disconnect, right? Like around, like, how do I connect with someone else emotionally? Um, a lot of times it's around our own discomfort with dealing with emotions in general, right? So it's like, if mm -hmm. I feel anxious, if I feel sadness, that is uncomfortable for me. And so I don't tend to experience it within myself. Does that make sense? It does, um, yeah. Um, and so I think that what I would recommend, you know, parents or whatnot, I think it's really checking in with yourself and really being curious about your own internal experiences to help you to feel more comfortable with emotions. Um, and having even the language around emotions, I think a lot of us don't have, like I didn't growing up, like, you know, what are the different emotions? Um, so I think having, there's, um, there's this thing called the feeling wheel. Um, so if you Google it, it'll come up a feeling wheel, but there's a wheel of all these different emotions. So I, I would say just strengthening your own, you know, awareness of emotions, how do you label it? And then I think the other part is just checking in, starting off with just asking children, your loved ones, like, hey, how are you feeling? How are mm -hmm. you doing? That can go a really long way. I think it, and it, it you know, even if it takes, a, you know, some time until the other person feels comfortable to share, or maybe like if you have, I've never done that, the person may be like, wait, what? Why are you asking me how I'm feeling? <laughs> uh, but I think it's still, it still will make a positive impact right? Um, yeah. And it will start that process of change. So I think checking in more regularly around how people, how loved ones are feeling. Um, and then just, you know, being, having more quality time, like spending more dedicated time. Um, I think to really be able to connect, we need more time together, right? And we need to be curious right. about one another's experiences. Um, I, I, I love that. I love that feedback. I, I have a question from Mastoff over here. She's intrigued yellow. Feel free to follow yeah. her. She's great at what she does. She says, 
when you check in within the Persian community, they may think you need them for something. They never take love at a face value. How do you remedy that? Um, so, so when you check in to see how someone's doing, I think you just remedy it by doing it more. <laughs> so I think, I think like, you know, I, that's, I feel like if people feel that way, I think making it more normal, I, we don't need to wait for people to be struggling for us to check in, like making it part of your own routine. Like, Hey, every month, every week, I'm going to ch- call someone and say, Hey, how are you doing? And that, and that's it. That's the intention of a conversation to mm-hmm. connect and to see how they're doing. I think the more that people may, I think, respond at times negatively or just be surprised because it maybe is just part of, it's not something that they're used to in relationships. Um, but when you do it enough and nothing else is being asked after that, I think people don't get used to it. <laughs> you, you know, <laughs> you know, what I, <laughs> you know <laughs> right? You know what I would really love? Uh, and maybe somebody's doing it, but I just don't know about it. But I think that, and I'm not trying to pick on Persian parents, but Uh, I feel like a lot of what our generation has gone through is as a result, whether intentional or not, doesn't matter, uh, has impacted us. And I just feel like right now, um, uh, there are a lot of older psychiatrists, psychologists that have their radio shows and television shows. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're talking about things in Farsi and stuff. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm sure that they're great at what they do as well. But there's not enough voices from the younger generation, such as yourself and other Mm -hmm. psychologists that can like, share the, the younger perspective better, you know, mm-hmm. like a, a 60, 70, 80 year old man, Iranian man or woman, can, yes, they can study, they can understand, they can have right. patience, but they haven't felt it, you know, and I hope that, especially because now, you know, I'm meeting with so many more people like yourself, uh, that they're all in their 20s and their 30s and 40s, and I'm like, man, you guys need to like come together and, and be able to like speak more on behalf of literally millions of other people yeah. that are, are just the regulars that aren't, you know, aren't able to have the resource that you guys have just so they can hear that. Because what I hate the most is that there's still a lot of Persian parents that dismiss the importance of, or the existence of mental health, first of all, mm-hmm. which I think the denial aspect of it is horrendous, but then also dismissing the professionals, you know, like lit, mm-hmm. as a, and, and with all due respect to you, I'm just saying like, but they dismiss the, the entire uh, some of them the, the, as, yeah. as a career psychology and like that is just so harmful to have these blinders on and not be mm-hmm. um, welcoming or accepting of of hundreds of years of research and studies and you know all that stuff I mean uh, you know up, outside of Iran the global community respects the field of psychology and and all of the people that have done all this research and I just wish that Persians could kind of like open up to that as well do you have any thoughts about that any any opinions about it no, I, I agree with you. I mean, I do think that we have progressed like a lot. So I think even though, since I've been in graduate school and, um, you know, years ago and now being out of it, I do feel like there is a significant difference. I feel like parents are more willing. I'll even have parents contact me to get their children into therapy. So I do, I have seen and experienced a difference, but I do agree with you. I think that there's still a lot of room that uh, for growth and just awareness around mental health. Um, my thought is, you know, and this is why I was so excited when you contacted me, is I, I think the change is really through these kind of conversations, Iman, through right. talking about these things more. Through th- talking about it in, you know, I think a lot of times people have this idea of who goes and sees a professional. You must be really struggling to go see a psychologist, right? And there oftentimes a lot of more negative other things that they'll say. <laughs> but I think just for, but when we're able to expose that, like, you know, you and I are having a conversation around the importance of mental health and, you know, why, you know, how this could be helpful, our relationships, this and that. I think that within itself reduces the stigma. So I I would just encourage people to do more and more of this. I think these conversations of mental health should be happening in all fields um, because our mental health impacts everything, just like your physical health. And it's something that we all have. Um, So I would just say just more dialogue around it can make a difference. Um, and hopefully with time, right? So hopefully with time, these things will change. Um, but I have seen the change. I think we just need to see more of it. So one of our mutual friends, the fabulous Orly, uh, my yeah. ghost host, just said the simple act of calling someone and not texting is a beautiful way of checking yeah. in on someone. And really is, you know, it's great to see a familiar, 
a familiar face making a phone call. Like nowadays, it's like, who's calling? You know? Like, what yeah. Is, what, what do you want? So if it's just, I'm just checking in on you. That's great. So yeah, early, yeah. Be, we'll be checking in on you soon. Yeah, early. That was great. No, really, it goes. When I have people call me, like, hey, I was just thinking of you. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's so nice. Thank you. Yeah. Like, it really has a powerful effect, um, right. especially this right. day and age when we're all just stuck to our phones and, you know, responding electronically. Absolutely. And, and you know, one, one thing, I'll kind of put it out here right now because I like to hold myself to the fire. Um, but, you know, I've done this IG Live thing every single day so far. I'm going to do it the rest of the month. And it's not sustainable to do it, obviously, every day forever. Uh, yeah. But w what, one thing that I did realize is that I will definitely be doing more IG Lives. I'm going to get back to doing more podcast episodes. And one thing that I'm going to do for sure, and I haven't coined the name yet, but something like a Mental Mondays, where like Mondays mm -hmm. I'm going to dedicate to having individuals like you, uh, also, people who want to maybe share their trials and tribulations yeah. and how they overcame, uh, you know, perhaps a suicide attempt or something, mm -hmm. you know, like to, again, have these discussions in the hopes that it touches the people that really, really need to hear it uh, in mm -hmm. case, you know, they've kind of been under a rock for a while. So uh, yeah. I just I just want you to know that I'm so grateful for what you do for the community. Uh, it's Thank such you. a noble career. And uh, we just we just love and appreciate the efforts that, that you and the like uh, do. It, it really helps. Uh, humans and it helps our community and that's why I, I want to continue having these conversations with you thank you so in much the yeah no I would love that and I so appreciate you and everything you're doing and I'm just so grateful to have been able to have this conversation so thank you with you of course it was short and sweet but definitely not yeah. the end we're going to continue having these and, Absolutely. I, and I want to wish you and your family an incredible holiday season and hopefully we'll we'll, we'll start off 2022 right uh, with a lot of great conversations yeah. about mental health <laughs> All right. Absolutely. Yes. Take and good care. Bye. Take Happy care, holidays. Was, Bye, everyone. Thank it was you. A pleasure. Bye. Bye. Ladies Bye. and gentlemen, thank you so much for tuning in. As the lovely Dr. Shiva signs off, just a friendly reminder that tomorrow I have an incredible guest. Uh, it's the one and only Mary Opik. If you know Mary, then you know just how talented and incredible of a woman uh, she is. She was a child star back in Iran and just a well renowned director, writer, producer, actress. Uh, she has a new uh, feature film, excuse me, short film, illustration film that is uh, being nominated for, uh, considered for nomination for Academy Awards. I'm going to have the rest of the details come tomorrow, but that's tomorrow at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, what a pleasure to have um, uh, Mary Apik a part of us. And then uh, next Wednesday, uh, Zendigi. Please join us for an incredible five-hour episode of Zendigi, Persian music live stream. Click the link in my bio. Set a reminder. And I uh, appreciate you guys. Wishing you guys all an amazing day. Happy Christmas Eve in advance. Much love and see you soon. Ciao.